Okay, wonderful. We're going to go ahead and get started. Here, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. My name is Kay Papa Cristo, and I'm the Education Director at Alzheimer's Resource of Alaska, and I have the pleasure of being your facilitator today. I'm sure you're all looking forward to this presentation, so let's quickly get a little bit of Zoom housekeeping out of the way. Uh, then I'll introduce our speakers and they'll take it away. I have muted all participants upon entry. We ask that you please remain muted for the duration of the presentation. Any questions you have during the presentation can be asked in the chat box, which I will be monitoring. After the presentation, our presenters will address the questions from the chat box. Then we will have a live Q&A session where you can unmute and mute yourselves as needed. Now I'd like, take, like to take a moment to introduce our distinguished presenters today, Dr. Kelly Drew and Denise Daniello. Dr. Drew is the Director and Principal Investigator at University of Alaska's Center Trim. She also she is also a professor for the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at University of Alaska at Fairbanks. In addition, she organized and now coordinates the PhD program in Biochemistry and Neuroscience at UAF. Dr. Drew is recognized for her many published papers, her leadership as an NIH-funded investigator, and a founder of Be Cool Pharmaceuticals, a small molecule drug company focused on therapeutic treatments for brain and spinal cord injuries. Denise Daniello, our other presenter, holds a master's in cultural anthropology and is currently serving as the administrator program coordinator for the UA Center TRIM. Denise is renowned for her long career as an advocate and leader in improving ge geriatric health care and ensuring high quality long-term support services for Alaska seniors. She has served as the Executive Director of Alaska Commission on Aging, Executive Director of Fairbanks Senior Center, and Manager of the Geriatric Education Center at UAF. We are also proud to say that she sits on the board of Alzheimer's Resource of Alaska. Thank you both so much for being here today. And with no further ado, the floor is yours. Awesome, thank you Kay. That's such a great introduction. Really appreciate that and it's a pleasure to be here today. We also wanna thank Alzheimer's Resource uh, of Alaska for being our partner on this effort. So hi everyone, I'm Denise Daniello, and um, as some of you may know, um, else, I'm gonna need to shut my uh, video off because, um, let me see how to do that, because I'm worried about preserving my bandwidth, just so you know, but, I, but I'm here. Um, so as some of you may know, November, November is Alzheimer's Disease Awareness Month, as well as Family Caregivers Month. So in honor of that observance, um, we will provide uh, information uh, about the new UA Center for Transformative Research and Metabolism and touch on some of the research that we're, be that we're doing to address brain health as well as healthy aging. So this seminar is our very first stakeholder presentation. So don't be shy. Um, let us know how we're doing and uh, hopefully we'll We'll, with your help, we'll be going in the right direction to address critical health care needs in Alaska. So the UA Center for Transformative Research in Metabolism, or TRIM, we call it for short, is a brand new program. We're only one years old as of last July. And we're working hard to establish this interdisciplinary biomedical research center at the university. We got our start through a grant from the National Institutes of Health General Medical Sciences using the Centers of Biomedical Research of Excellence, that for short, it's COBRI, it's a funding mechanism, um, in order to start this program. And um, Dr. Drew, uh, as the principal investigator, wrote this amazing grant application that's, I don't know, more than 600 pages long. So on June, July 16th of last year, 
we were awarded uh, the amount of $11.8 million uh, to kick off the center. And um, TRIM is eligible for two five-year grant renewals for a total of 15 years and an additional $17 million. The funding supports three research projects, two research cores, an administrative admin, uh, an administrative admin core, or admin core, and also we have funding uh, for new pilot projects to be determined. So our primary focus uh, for the center is the study of hibernation, particularly changes that occur in metabolism during hibernation, as we believe these changes may hold novel clues for developing diagnostics and therapies to treat metabolic disease in humans. Now, um, if you're a clinical uh, provider, Metabol me metabolic health is defined as having ideal levels of sugar, blood sugar, triglycerides, high density lipoprotein cholesterol, HDL, you know that stands for the happy uh, cholesterol, blood pressure, waist of, and waist circumference without using any medication. So these factors directly relate to a person's risk for diabetes, sarcopenia, uh, which means the loss of skeletal muscle and strength, heart disease, and even dementia caused by Alzheimer's disease um, and stroke, which can lead to, to vascular dementia. So hibernation is a unique evolutionary adaptation that some uh, northern mammals use to survive Alaska's cold winter. When it's too cold for us to go outside and food is scarce for the many animals uh, that run around, some Arctic mammals hibernate for most of the winter. Interestingly, they don't eat, they don't drink any water, they don't move around for months. But amazingly, in the springtime, they arouse from hibernation in perfect health, with no negative effects to their bone, muscle, or any, part of, any other part of their bodies, uh, to our knowledge. So these changes that occur during hibernation are related to changes in the, meta in the animal's metabolism. And so our focus is to better understand these metabolic changes that happen during hibernation to see how they can be applied to treat metabolic health disorders, particularly those that, diseases that impact um, older adults and other people at risk. And I'm having problems changing my slide. Okay, there you go. Well, I just want to say thank you uh, to Kay and to the um, Alzheimer's Resource Agency, as well as to Denise, who brings a just a spectacular uh, set of skills and uh, perspectives to our center. Um, so I, I'm a scientist uh, that has studied hibernation for many, many years, uh, as have others at UAF. And so now we have a center of excellence in hibernation science. Uh, the center builds on our proven history and hibernation research that I'll tell you more about, um, as well as uh, the infrastructure and long-term commitment of the university um, to hibernation research. Uh, and so the center will apply what we've learned um, in hibernation that we've been doing for a long time, but for the first time, this is really, we have a focus now to apply this to developing uh, new therapies for humans. So we support investigators at all stages, um, in what we call translational studies. And so these are studies that are meant to understand basic mechanisms and principles and then apply those for clinical application. So we are the very first biomedical research center in the US to adopt hibernation as a model of natural adaptation in metabolism and an approach to treat metabolic disease. So while many people have um, uh, have uh, proposed that um, hibernation holds clues to improve human health. We're the first center now that has that as its mission to uh, translate um, this understanding for human therapies. Uh, and with that, I have a special um, guest to show you that you really need to see, um, and that is the hibernating our ground squirrel. So this is our primary inspiration. Let me see if you can... Um, I'll show you there. We love to take these little guys out uh, and pass them around so people can hold them. I just picked this, uh, this one up out of its um, little hibernacula. It's a cold room where the ground squirrels hibernate throughout the winter. We actually trap them um, 
Let me see if I can get them to show up. Trap them from the Brooks Range, which is my background picture, at the same time of year that we trap them, typically in July, and we bring them back, um, and we put them in uh, uh, cold rooms designed to hold animals, and they go into a state of hibernation. So this is, in fact, the remarkable metabolic adaptation that if we understand the mechanisms, we believe that we can translate that into human um, therapies. And so this animal is not anesthetized. It's not sleeping. It is hibernating. Um, they're so much fun to hold because they're little furry animals. Um, trying to get this picture to be stable. They're very furry. They look as though, um, you know, like, um, <laughs> it's hard to explain, but you can tell he's very unique, uh, that he's, um, he's not moving, uh, and, um, will eventually over the next hour or so, now that I've handled uh, him, will wake up and come back to normal temperature, and then will, within a day, go back down into hibernation. So this is, hibernation is just an amazing metabolic adaptation that we'll tell you more about as the slides go on. And I wish I could hand them around for everybody to hold. The one unique thing that you can't appreciate in the picture is that um, he's very cold. So he lives in a room that is uh, right around freezing, and his body temperature uh, goes down to about that temperature. So he feels a bit like an ice cube right now. But he's very cute. All right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thanks, class. Kelly, for showing. You know what a uh, hibernating squirrel reminds me of? I don't know if how many of you out there are Star Trekkies. In the old Star Trek series, there um, was this one show called Trouble with Tribbles. So they're, they're kind of like a tribble, you know, except they've got um, hands and feet. But, yeah, they're very curry, uh, cuddly and furry. And, yeah, they're kind of cute. They're very cute. They're very tame while they're hibernating. When uh, this animal wakes up, it's a wild yeah. animal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, actually, maybe I'll, I'll pick him up again so I can, maybe it will illustrate. But so UAF, and particularly the Institute of Arctic Biology, has a long legacy, 60-year legacy of research and um, discoveries in hibernation. So way back in 1960, uh, there was a, a, a Robert Hawk, um, who's now famous for being the first to really explore this phenomenon in uh, hibernating animals. And he's uh, known to, uh, um, to go out and look not just at ground squirrels, but also hibernating bears, and to put rectal temperature um, thermometers into those bears to identify that they were actually very cold in the hibernate. Um, bears actually don't get quite as cold as um, ground squirrels. Ground squirrels, like I said, will go down to actually um, below freezing, but bears will stay more in the realm of the human uh, low temperature uh, range, which is um, between uh, 32 and uh, around 30 degrees uh, Celsius. So in 1963 is when the Institute of Arctic Biology was founded, and much of hibernation research has occurred at the Institute of Arctic Biology. Um, but from the beginning, the uh, current director there was inspired by the comparative physiology of temperature regulation. And then later, another director of the Institute of Arctic Biology, Peter Morrison, uh, was active in hibernation research. And they, he and his uh, collaborator, um, Gouster, discovered that um, these little guys, what happens is they use up their glucose while they're hibernating, but then when they warm up, periodically they uh, make glucose. And so it's a process of gluconeogenesis to make glucose. Uh, another significant finding was in 1989, the now current director of the Institute, Brian Barnes, found that these animals, their core body temperature actually goes down below freezing when they hibernate, down to minus three centigrade, uh, which is quite remarkable for a mammal. Um, then later, he and his graduate student, Lauren Buck, found that they are very much regulating their metabolism um, below that minus three threshold. So that is kind of what we say is their threshold for turning on the heater. And once their body temperature goes below that temperature, then they start using energy to not go any colder. But until then, they're kind of at a minimal uh, 
metabolic rate, that in hibernation is actually one one hundredth or two one hundredth hundredth of their normal basal metabolic rate. So down to one to two percent of their basal metabolic rate when they hibernate. Uh, then my lab in 2011 found the mechanism, a mechanism, that will uh, works in the brain to regulate hibernation. And so we were able to induce hibernation in a ground squirrel, and that's what I'll tell you more about that we're trying to translate for human application. Oyvind Toyin uh, here, in, uh, also in 2011, published the first study that really demonstrated that black bears hibernate. So until then, it was considered to be a deep sleep that where they got cold, but there was no understanding of the metabolic suppression that occurred. And so for the first time when he published that paper, um, uh, it's now understood that animals, that black bears do hibernate, and that is defined as their metabolic suppression, where their, their metabolism goes down to 25% of their basal metabolic rate, whereas this guy goes down to 1% to 2% of its metabolic, basal metabolic rate. Uh, so another researcher here who is now part of our center is uh, Vadim Fedorov, and he's looked at gene expression in the hibernating brown squirrel and black bear, and has uncovered evidence that these animals actually make new protein. So another phenomenon of hibernation is that they remain in this inactive state. They don't eat for seven to eight months of the year, yet they wake up fit and trim with good muscle mass. They do not lose bone or muscle mass despite this long period of disuse. And the Dean through gene expression studies have, has found that um, they likely produce new muscle again during those periods of arousal that I'll talk more about. Um, and then of course the microbiome has been shown to be very important in metabolism and that is something that a group down in Anchorage led by Chris Douglas Dunn, also now a member of the center, is studying to understand how the microbiome contributes to some of these special adaptations of the ground squirrels. And as you can imagine, when they hibernate, when they're cold and they're not eating, the diversity of the microbiome is limited. It goes down. And so she's hoping to identify what those microbes are and how they contribute to the metabolic uh, resilience of these animals, and then find ways to uh, promote growth and sustainability of those microbes in the human gut. And then now in 2019, we have founded our new center, and we call it Transformative Research in Metabolism because we believe that the information we learn from these animals will transform our understanding of metabolism and have significant benefit for treating human disease. So, next slide. So this is the timeline that shows all of these publications um, that have been authored mostly by University of Alaska uh, Fairbanks authors. So starting back in 1964 um, all the way to 2020, based on our last count last summer, we've got 107 publications. Um, and, and that's over the last, you know, uh, well, many years, uh, let's see, I guess that's like 46 years <laughs> or so. And this research has pretty much focused on the phylo uh, physiologic, genetic, and the microbiome mechanisms uh, regulating hibernation. So this is an organizational chart for the center. So you could see there's so many different parts and pieces to it. Uh, it shows our lines of affiliation with the university's um, administration, as well as TRIM's three re current research projects right down here. We also have three cores uh, that we're going to talk about as well. So uh, we have the Advanced Instrumentation for Microbiome um, Studies core at the University of Alaska Anchorage, the Health and Metabolism Research Core at UAF, uh, as well as the Admin Core. Um, uh, that's here at the UAF campus. And we also have various committees too, uh, working committees, and our committee members are distinguished researchers, practitioners, and professors in their own right, both in Alaska and outside of Alaska. So um, we're going to provide a brief introduction um, about these research projects and cores, and um, 
And our research projects and cores all represent both campuses at UAF and UAA. So um, this is our next section of the presentation, and we're going to talk a little bit about the research underway, about hibernation, and how it could be applied for treatments to address conditions related to meta uh, metabolic health disorders. So as some of you may know, um, Alaska has a roadmap to address Alzheimer's disease and related dementias that was approved back in 2012. And it's now currently being updated and uh, the new uh, plan will be released in December. So there are six goals being proposed um, that track closely to the original plan. One of the goals is to promote innovation and re uh, research into effective interventions for dementia. So our program is working to develop new therapies based on hibernation science that hopefully will contribute uh, to that goal. So what have we learned so far with all this research? Well, um, we learned that hibernating mammals reduce their metabolic rate to uh, conserve energy. So, you know, for us, uh, you know, when it's cold in the house, instead of uh, turning up the thermo thermostat, some of us, in order to save money, will put a sweater on or a blanket. That's how we adapt uh, to the cold. But some northern mammals, uh, they embrace the cold, and um, they do that through hibernation. So one of the things that they do is that they drop their body temperature below freezing, and that's what the Arctic ground squirrel does, as, as Kelly mentioned. So not only do they, does the Arctic ground squirrel get super, super cold to the touch, they also reduce their respiration rate from 90 to 100 breaths per minute uh, to one to two breaths per minute. And that's for um, a hibernating ground squirrel. In addition, their heart rate falls from 200 to 300 beats per minute down to three to five, uh, three to five beats per minute. So as, as Kelly was saying, you know, if you ever get a chance to hold a hibernating ground squirrel, do it because it's, it's, it's amazing. It's so amazing. I, I had my first experience last year around this time. And uh, it's a real, real mind uh, blower, you know, how cold that they are. It's like holding on to a super, super, super cold ice cube, furry ice cube. So uh, um, another thing, too, that um, uh, mammals do when they hibernate is they switch their energy supply from carbohydrate to fat metabolism during hibernation. So I just want to show you a couple of video clips of a uh, hibernating ground squirrel up close. So as you can see here, this squirrel is starting to move a little bit. And um, don't pay attention to the audio, it's just, you know, background uh, talk. But um, yeah, so they move a little bit and this is called inner bout uh, arousal. So they start moving for a little while in order to, to you know, get their body temperatures up and when they get too cold. And now check this out. This is a black bear that's hibernating. I hope you can hear that. So some people say, you know, that when they hear this snoring bear, they, it reminds them of their spouse, you know, at nighttime in the bed, sleeping. <laughs> they take very shallow breaths, too, you know, just like the Arctic ground squirrel. So, you know, we've also learned, as Kelly mentioned, um, hibernators are able to preserve all of their muscle mass, despite not eating or drinking or moving for months on end. And we also uh, have discovered that there are certain genes that turn on and off during hibernation. 
So metabolism is comprised of two um, chemical pathways, anabolism and catabolism. So in anabolism, this is a chemical reaction where small molecules such as amino acids come together to form larger molecules like protein uh, to make muscle mass. And catabol catabolism is the opposite process where it involves breaking down more complex substances like proteins into simpler ones like amino acids. And these metabolic processes work hand in hand in all living organisms in order to produce energy and repair cells. So through one of the center's research projects, it was uh, Dr. Vadim Fedorov's work, uh, which we'll hear a little bit more about later on, uh, we found that during hibernation, there is this increased expression of anabolic genes. So those are the genes that turn on the anabolic pathways in order to, you know, use the smaller molecules in order to make the proteins and, the, and then the larger uh, muscle, uh, tissues that make muscle mass. And so we believe it's this emphasis on the anabolic processing, or we call anabolic sensitivity, that... Um, among other factors that allows a hibernating mammal uh, to preserve their muscle mass and strength despite not moving around uh, or eating. So, um, so we, we, uh, it's our belief and our hope that um, we will be able to translate the findings from this research in, into targeted therapies in order to help people who are in long-term care convalescent settings who also don't move around but they lose a lot of muscle mass and strength. And uh, one other uh, thing too that we discovered is about body chemicals and, and how they change uh, during hibernation. So uh, we've discovered that thyroid um, hormones regulate both body temperature and metabolism. And uh, they play a key role too in regulating hibernation and inner bout arousal. So this, uh, this slide shows data uh, that explains a little bit more of the, of the life history of the Arctic ground squirrel. These are animals that you'll find up north, and um, we see them kind of starting at the Yukon River and going north, uh, as well as in Denali um, Park. So a lot of them around Denali Park and along the Denali Highway. Uh, so this little guy is beginning to go through that waking up. He was moving, oh, there he goes, he's moving a little bit. And so what this graph shows is um, on the axes, on the left ac Y axis, you can see body temperature. And so in the summertime, it's around 37. Actually, it can get pretty warm, even more than 40. They're not very good at regulating their body temperature. And so they're up running around. Um, you see quite a lot of variation in the body temperature during the summer. Uh, and then in, um, as winter begins, approaches in September, he'll go down into his burrow and there his metabolism will decrease and then his body temperature will decrease and all the way down to near zero. And this shows the seasonal pattern of that, that um, you can see the minimum of body temperature on the, on the bottom. And so once it gets very cold in his uh, hibernacula, in his little burrow, then his body temperature can actually drop below freezing. And they do these uh, inner bout arousals. Uh, and during that time is where it appears that they rebuild. And so they, um, they use their glucose uh, and their fats. Uh, they burn mostly fats when they're in hibernation. Um, and then when they warm up, that's when those genes uh, are expressed that in stimulate muscle uh, rebuilding. And we think also that they rebuild their neurons and their synapses uh, and do all kinds of uh, regenerative processes. Um, but that's the life history. It's really not a bad life. You know, they, um, they're down underground and pretty oblivious most of the winter. They wake up in spring and April where they can mate, uh, reproduce, have babies, and then they get to eat as much as they want and double their body weight until they do it all again. And each year when they wake up, they're fit and trim and ready to go for a nice summer out on the, on the Arctic tundra. So why is this relevant? Because it's this highly regulated and adaptive, reversible state of metabolic flexibility and anabolic sensitivity. And that's what we believe is the magic in these animals, um, that if we understand it, we'll be able to replicate it. Next slide. 
So uh, now this next section, we're going to talk about who we are and what we do. And so we're going to be talking about our specific research projects, our core resources, and the key uh, personnel involved with the center. And again, uh, representing both UAF campus and UAA campus. And so we have um, the, the grant from NIH supports three projects. Uh, we hope to expand the affiliation with the center, and that's something that we're working on now. But um, our three core projects, um, key yeah, core projects, is one is Vadim Fedorov that we talked about, and he's looking at uh, the gene expression uh, using new technology to identify which genes are expressed, um, not only the gene, but also the protein that is involved with um, preventing muscle atrophy during this long period of disuse. And then we have Chris Douglasson down at uh, UAA, and her expertise is in um, microbiology and particularly the, uh, the gut microbiome. And so her research is looking to see if the microbiome, the bacteria in the ground squirrel gut, actually provides essential amino acids to build protein uh, during hibernation. And then Troy Coker is our kind of clinical uh, visionary. So he is not an expert in hibernation. He's an expert in uh, nutritional therapies. Um, so he actually is uh, running a clinical trial that you may hear about and have an opportunity to enroll in uh, to look at a precise formulation of amino acids um, to see how that will affect maintenance of skeletal muscle during weight loss. So it's a, it's a condition called sarcopenic obesity that when people um, are older and they try to lose weight to improve metabolic health, they actually lose muscle. And that loss of muscle can have as many detrimental health consequences as being overweight. And so the question is, uh, how, how can you preserve muscle mass? And he has um, taken a, a evidence-based approach to formulate a specific combination of amino acids that um, shows great promise of being able to maintain muscle mass uh, despite uh, caloric restriction and weight loss. And that is a clinical trial that will be happening here at UAF um, utilizing our Health and Metabolism Research Board. Next slide. So we have um, our, our cores that uh, Denise told you about on the organizational chart. Oh, so this is another, um, before we get into the cores, the, we're also, not only are we able to support research in hibernation, but we're able to support other research related to our same mission, which is to better understand um, healthy aging. Uh, and so this is a, a project uh, run by Professor Duffy that is supported actually by the Alzheimer's Resource Association that we've been able to um, help with. And so that is through our molecular imaging core. So this is a wonderful, uh, exciting um, new model of using dogs as a, as a, as a test subject or a, um, a participant, a research participant to look at healthy brain aging. So the interesting thing about the canine model is that they show many of the same metabolic alterations that humans do with aging, uh, as well as um, dementia and some of the changes in the brain related to dementia, but they do it on a much faster timeline because they live, live less, they, they live a shorter time. And so you'll see a dog age across 15 years, um, whereas a human may take 80 to 90 years. Um, and so it's a model that is a, a faster timeline that once the baseline is established, uh, we can look at interventions to uh, promote healthy aging, um, both for the dog's health as well as for human health. So it's there's kind of the, the first subjects to test some of these interventions. And so Dr. Duffy's project um, is, uh, is, um, is focused on establishing these baseline characteristics of dogs as they age. I actually have a, a dog who suffers from dementia at home. He's 16 years old now. And so I can really appreciate this uh, project. Um, and we're able to support it through the center 
um, with use of our core resources, one of which is the MRI that we have as a partnership with um, uh, the uh, Foundation Health at FMH, uh, and also with personnel, um, Dr. Carl Murphy, he runs the MRI, uh, as well as Scott Jerome, Dr. Uh, Jerome, is uh, our research navigator. So he helps the uh, scientists come in and navigate what is needed for clinical research. Uh, and then Nina Hansen is our uh, veterinary, um, uh, provides veterinary oversight, and uh, she is really an expert in uh, um, dogs and dog health, and particularly dog metabolism, uh, as the uh, head veterinarian for the Yukon Quest. And then Shahab Sultani is a research assistant working with Professor Duffy. So it takes a whole team to bring this uh, kind of a project um, to fruition, and we're really excited about the model and hope that it will uh, promote the um, ability to translate some of our discoveries. Also, we are looking to expand our capacity for human clinical research, and so together they complement one another in um, interventions uh, and study of the interventions and the efficacy of those interventions. So next slide. So I just wanted to say, too, that um, Dr. Larry Duffy is uh, another board member of the Alzheimer's Resource Agency of Alaska. And Professor Duffy is uh, renowned for his... Uh, uh, discoveries in Alzheimer's disease and aging research. So it's really exciting to be able to work with him on this. So um, as we mentioned before, the center has two uh, cores, two research cores. And so I'm going to talk about the first one. It's called the Advanced Investigations in Microbiome Sciences, or AIMS for short. And uh, AIMS is located at the UAA campus. Uh, Dr. Brandon Briggs is the core leader uh, with support from Eric Henderson, who serves as the lab manager. And the research focus for AIMS is to promote expertise and resources that support the growth of microbial research uh, in Alaska. So this slide uh, just shows a sample of the equipment um, that they use in their lab. So in their first year, uh, AIMS has been successful in developing a thorough pipeline that has categorized micro, uh, microbial communities and isolates. So they've incorporated 54 unique microbial species, and that number is growing. And it's the only lab in the state with expertise in microbial research. And so they provide research support to all of our research projects, uh, from experimental design and sample collection to data analysis and bioinformatics. So Ames has been doing some other work, too, uh, in addition to TRIM, uh, that relates to COVID-19. So um, in one instance, uh, the state has contracted with the Ames lab uh, in order to mass produce this um, medium called viral transport media, or uh, VTM. And that's used to preserve a person's COVID-19 testing sample uh, when it's transported from where that sample is taken to the state lab for analysis. So uh, prior to uh, contracting with Ames, the state was in very short supply of this VTM, which limited the testing capacity. So uh, with Ames, um, we have been able to increase uh, the testing capacity for Alaska. And Ames is now involved in testing wastewater for COVID-19. Um, to detect evidence of COVID. And um, so this knowledge is giving community a heads up, an early warning about COVID's presence even before their, pres their residents can show symptoms in order to make necessary preparations. The Ames Corps is also working to become a recharge center, uh, meaning that it will charge users for use of its services, not just give them away. Um, and hopefully that will reduce reliance on university funding. I think we went too fast, there we go. And this is the Health and Metabolism Research Corps um, where Professor Duffy is doing his work. It uh, includes uh, Dr. Carl Murphy and uh, Scott Jerome, uh, who I mentioned, as well as Oyvind Toyan who really is an expert in animal instrumentation. So he's the one that uh, did all that work in bears and published that paper. Um, and so he's really an expert at being able to monitor some of the physiology of our research animals. 
uh, and maintains the equipment that you see at the bottom. That's a, a system for measuring uh, metabolism or the rate of oxygen consumption in either ground squirrels or bears. Uh, and then um, Dr. Murphy uh, manages the also, in, in addition to the MRI, NMR instruments uh, in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry that are used for all kinds of things from being able to look at um, the uh, number of metabolites in tissues or serum, as well as uh, looking at the structure of specific molecules, looking at uh, stability of molecules over time, uh, and anything to do with a, a molecule, uh, you can measure it with NMR just about. And then there's the DEXA um, down in the far corner that is used uh, for the, um, the clinical trial that Dr. Coker is uh, uh, running that will um, quantify body composition. So this also ha is now running as a recharge center. It still gets a lot of support from the university. Um, we, we serve the community for veterinary diagnostics, which is the only uh, MRI available for, um, for veterinary use uh, in the state. For human use, it is um, uh, restricted to research, which makes it uh, ideal for research projects because it's not encumbered by so much clinical use. Uh, and so it really is a, a unique state resource. The core is also recognized by the University of um, Washington uh, as a, as a um, regional hub for clinical research uh, in Alaska. Next slide. So this is the administrative core, and um, so we're located at the UAF campus, and you met uh, Dr. Drew. Uh, she's the center director and principal investigator. Dr. Anya Gorshpashnia, and uh, I hope I didn't murder her name too much. <laughs> she serves a du dual role for us as um, our research scientist for the admin core, and she also provides um, research, research support for Dr. Uh, Fedorov's project. And um, Dr. Bahara Bharati, uh, she's our biostatistic, biostatistician, so she provides statistical and data analysis for uh, TRIMS investigators and other faculty working in the field. Bahara is the owner, owner of Bharati Medical, and she recently received a Small Business Innovation Research Award uh, for her work. Danielle Dupee, uh, she's new to the TRIM program, and um, she recently joined as our fiscal technician and admin assistant. She's an experienced grants officer for the University of Alaska Fairbanks and has lots of budget experience, so that's really good. And then me, I mean, you already met me. So one of our uh, projects that are funded by our um, center grant uh, is to do a renovation out of the large animal research station. So we're going to have to start calling it large and small animal because we are uh, we have actually um, done the renovation to create a facility for breeding Arctic ground squirrels. And um, so it's an outdoor facility that uh, we feel will um, meet their some of their seasonal rhythms uh, best, better than what we can do in captivity, and also provide opportunity for behavioral uh, observations and research um, at the same time. So we have uh, six 500 square foot pins um, where it houses the ground squirrels. They haven't been uh, released out there yet. It's probably uh, next spring uh, is when they'll first occupy after some grass has grown and uh, it looks a little prettier. Um, but uh, the other benefit of this facility is that uh, evidence uh, shows that um, there's a ground squirrel hepatitis virus that is endemic in this population. Uh, and so we are screening, uh, we will screen the animals that go to the breeding facility so that they are uh, hepatitis free. This is not a kind of hepatitis that can be uh, transferred to humans, but it certainly impacts the animal's health. And actually that's another topic of a research um, project uh, that um, we'll be looking at uh, the, the um, influence of hepatitis virus on metabolism. Uh, it's, uh, so anyway, uh, it's pretty interesting. And um, so our long-term goal is to provide pathogen-free ground squirrel colony, both for our own researchers as well as to our collaborators uh, outside of Alaska so we can broaden the bandwidth of uh, what can be used to study these animals 
Uh, and we want to do that in a safe and sustainable manner. So by breeding uh, them, we will have less impact on the wild population. Next slide. So this is uh, our vision, mission, and value statement for the center. So our vision is to translate hibernation research to improve human health. And our mission is to seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of hibernating mammals and to translate that knowledge or apply that knowledge in order to enhance human health, lengthen life, and reduce illness and disability. Our values um, use uh, our, the letters in our acronym uh, that spell out TRIM. So T um, meaning um, team science, and that involves incorporating multiple diverse perspectives and expertise in order to empower great and innovative science. R is for respect, respecting each person for their unique perspective, expertise, and contribution to the overall effort. I is for integrity, helping people to be the best at what they do best and keeping a high ethical standard. And M, standing for motivation, meaning to motivate oneself and others to do the job better than it's been done before in order to create a cycle of empowerment and accomplishment for both the scientific community and the Institute. So as you can see, our values embody team collaboration. That's really key uh, for the center and are working together in order to visualize our desired outcome to improve healthy aging across the lifespan uh, using this hibernation science um, as our platform, our research platform. So our value statement was approved by TRIM's um, internal steering committee uh, in August. So now uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about our research and how it's being used to uh, improve human health, again, with this focus on Meta metabolic health disorders, because this is one area of significant concern to Alaska's senior population. Well, if you haven't heard, um, Alaska is the state with the fastest growing senior population per capita. And not only that, people aged 60 years and older in Alaska are the fastest growing age demographic. So it's this large number of aging baby boomers. Baby boomers um, were born between the years of 1946 to 1964. They're the ones who are responsible for the growth of the senior population. It's not new people moving from outside the state, but it's people who have lived here a long time. So um, many of these people uh, that uh, came to Alaska when they were young, um, they, and maybe some of them are you, uh, they moved to the state during the pipeline construction era and uh, back in the early 1970s uh, as young people wanting to take high paying jobs when our economy was booming. So unlike former migrants who moved to Alaska to make their wealth and then left, these young baby boomers stayed. They, um, they you know, bought homes, uh, they were working and they st established themselves and many of them, including some of us, are still here. So in 2019, there were 138,572 um, Alaskans aged 60 years and older. And now that's an increase from 3,400 seniors from um, last year. And since 2010, the senior population has increased 52%. Seniors between the ages of 70 to 74 are now the fastest growing age co cohort of the senior population. They're growing about uh, at 10% um, annually. And that's an emerging trend because previously it, wa it was the younger seniors, people between the ages of 60 to 64 who were growing the fastest, but now um, baby boomers are aging into their later years. So while the numbers of older seniors are increasing and the number of younger seniors are declining, that will mean that within the next 10 years or so, the senior population is going to stabilize in number and become older over time. So this graph is a projection out into the future from 2020 uh, to 2045. And Alaska's senior population is gonna keep on growing uh, to 2030 and then stabilize uh, until about 2040 to 2045, where we're going to see a slight uptick. And at that time, people between the ages of 60 to 69, um, there are going to be fewer of those, and we're going to see uh, the older 
age cohorts increase dramatically in numbers, particularly people age 85 and older. We're going to see a, a triple in size of that population. And many of those older adults are going to be living with chronic health conditions like diabetes, sarcopenia, cardiovascular disease, and dementia. And they're going to be at much higher risk than younger people. So why is the study of hibernation important to human health and Alaskans' health? So, and what does this mean for older adults? Well, well, not, not a causal factor, age does increase your risk uh, for um, many diseases and frailty. For example, type 2 diabetes is a metabolic health disorder and is the sixth leading cause of death among adults age 65 and older. And the risk for diabetes increases with age. And it's also associated with a number of other uh, chronic health conditions like um, cardiovascular disease, depression, hearing loss, damage to your eyes, to your kidneys, can even cause dizziness and, and uh, make older people more at risk for falling down, which could lead to uh, hip fractures and even traumatic brain uh, injury. Diabetes has also been shown to be implicated with some forms of dementia, like Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. Another really interesting uh, factor, too, that plays into this is muscle mass. And muscle mass has been shown to be positively correlated with one's abilities to carry out basic activities of daily living, or ADLs, as well as instrumental activities of daily living, uh, for short, IADLs. And it's these basic activities of daily living, those um, are the skills that you use to, for personal hygiene, for grooming, getting dressed, toileting, transferring, and eating. But uh, IADLs are more, involve a more complex set of skills, and they allow a person to live independently in the community. So while the IADLs are not required for functional living, they do significantly improve one's quality of life. So they include things like being able to use the phone, go shopping, preparing meals, keeping your house clean, using transportation, taking your medications correctly, and managing your finances. So while not the only factor, people with low muscle mass have been shown to have a correspondingly lower ability to conduct these activities of daily living and instrumental uh, activities of daily living. Further, it's been shown that muscle mass is most important um, in determining the risk of hip fracture because muscle helps you to maintain your balance so you don't fall down and um, maybe you know, break a bone, break a hip. Uh, and there are other uh, contributing factors related to met metabolic health that have consequences for healthy brain injury. For example, there was a new Australian uh, study that was re released recently that shows that type 2 diabetes is also linked to a decline in verbal memory and fluency over five years among older adults living in the community. And other studies have shown that type 2 diabetes can, can double the risk of dementia in older people. So again, our long-term goal is to apply what has been learned about these mechanisms that operate during hibernation um, and to see how we can um, utilize uh, these findings in order to develop therapeutics um, to treat uh, these conditions. So as the senior population continues to grow, especially people of older age, we're going to see an, an increasing number of Alaskans who are affected by dementia, as well as their family caregivers. There is mounting evidence that supports this relationship between metabolic disorders and muscle wasting that can lead to cognitive decline with aging, as well as an increased risk for cardiovascular disease that can result in vascular dementia due to stroke. So we're going to take a closer look at the impacts of, of dementia in Alaska and then we'll talk more specifically about hibernation research and its application. So this slide um, shows images of a healthy uh, brain that weighs about three pounds and comprises about 2% of your overall body weight. It has about 100 billion neurons, and each neuron has um, 
these branching extensions called synapses and um, that help to uh, the neurons in your brain to be able to communicate with each other and also uh, through these tiny bursts of uh, chemicals to transfer energy and, and, and nutrients. And um, the human brain has about 100 trillion synapses. And that's a huge number. Um, one trillion is one million million followed by 12 zeros. So you can imagine how many, 100, 12, 100 trillion, uh, that number, how big that number is. And this is uh, the brain of an Alzheimer's patient, and this is the brain of a vascular uh, dementia patient. And while there are many uh, different forms of dementia, dementia, remember, is a symptom of disease. It's not a disease in itself. The symptoms are pretty much the same, and they progress over time. Um, and they're associated with difficulties with memory, being able to perform daily activities, having problems with language, being able to find words, uh, problem solving, and thinking ability are affected as well. And all of these changes affect a person's ability to perform everyday activities. So dementia has many causes. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, and it's responsible for 60 to 80 percent of dementia cases. It's a progressive disorder, and sadly, there's no cure at present, but we do have hope. About one in 10 seniors um, age 65 and older is estimated to have Alzheimer's disease, and vascular dementia, which is the second most common form, um, is typically associated with stroke. So um, in Alzheimer's disease, um, it's characterized by this accumulation of protein fragments called beta amyloids. And they are found on the outside of the neuron cells. And then the other uh, characteristic um, trait of Alzheimer's is these, this accumulation of the protein tau that's found within, inside of the neuron. So it's a combination of these, this accumulation of the beta amyloid plaques and then this protein tau that, uh, that form tangles uh, within the brain's neurons. It's the, this, uh, these two um, processes that interfere with uh, the neurons being able to communicate with each other and for them to receive nutrition that results in um, cellular loss and, and uh, areas of the brain. Uh, of the brain um, that die. And so as a result, you have these deep uh, grooves in the brain that form, uh, that, that's called sulci, and then the overall size of the brain uh, shrinks. So in addition to that plaque and uh, tau um, accumulation, um, the brain has other changes, including inflammation too. And um, the presence of all these toxic um, substances in the brain leads to um, an increased production of of uh, the brain trying the brain's immune cells uh, to, to come into gear, and uh, those immune cells are called microglia, and they try to mop up all of this um, you know widespread debris of plaques and tangles and um, dead neurons, and sometimes. Uh, you know, oftentimes they can't do it. So you have chronic inflammation that comes into play. And, um, and then the, uh, that's what forms, you know, um, these different traits that happen with Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's begins um, in the hippocampus area of the brain, which is the innermost uh, core of the brain, and that uh, affects memory production. Um, and as the disease progresses and moves to the cerebral cortex, um, there are other changes, including um, loss of language, uh, judgment changes. There's um, these changes in behavior, agitation, irritation, uh, sundowning effect, uh, where, where people get their nights and days all mixed up. And in the final stages of the disease, uh, people sometimes can't um, recognize people who are familiar to them, their family members. They can't communicate, and then they're uh, no longer able to control their bodily functions. So people, uh, on average, with Alzheimer's disease uh, live for 8 to 10 years after diagnosis, but in some cases they can live longer, even as long as 20 years. 
So vascular dementia, on the other hand, is caused by conditions that narrow the brain's blood vessels. And these conditions um, include blocking the blood supply and the oxygen supply to the brain, and that causes neuron death, and, as well as debilitating brain injury. So um, many of the symptoms of vascular dementia look very close to Alzheimer's dementia, and uh, again, this can be a, a progressive type of disease. But the differences between the two is that with vascular dementia, it's triggered by a major cardiovascular event known as stroke. And so uh, you, you will see these changes appear uh, soon after stroke happens, uh, if it, you know, in, depending on how much of the brain is in, impacted. And it can affect one part of the body over another, or it could be a more generalized uh, effect. And with Alzheimer's, it's just a, a general progressive change in the loss of cognitive ability. So it's interesting to note that a lot of these changes that happen in Alzheimer's patients, for example, this um, excess accumulation of tau and this reduced oxygen supply that Kelly talked about, um, also happens in the brains of hibernating mammals. But it's interesting that the result is different than what happens in the brains of humans, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. So this graph shows the projected number of seniors uh, with Alzheimer's disease, people age 65 and older. So as the number of older Alaskans grow, you know, guess what? Uh, we're having an increasing number of people with Alzheimer's disease. So right now, it's estimated there is about 8,500 Alaskans um, with Alzheimer's disease. And by 2025, that number is going to grow to 11,000. And by 2030, the National Alzheimer's Association predicts that the number of seniors with Alzheimer's disease today in Alaska is going to more than triple. So um, by 2030, and that's going to be a huge increase. So the other thing to keep in mind is that these numbers only include the number of people with Alzheimer's disease. It doesn't include people with related disorders, such as Parkinson's disease, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia, and many other forms. This pie graph shows the estimated number of Alaskans age 65 and older um, who have Alzheimer's disease by age category. And Alzheimer's disease uh, is, um, we, we see that uh, it, age does increase the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease, but age in and of itself does not cause Alzheimer's disease. There's always some other uh, contributing factor. So for people with Alzheimer's disease, for seniors with Alzheimer's disease, 3% um, are between the ages of 65 to 74. 17% um, are between the ages of 75 to 84, and 32% are age 85 and older. And um, we calculated these numbers based on the prevalence rates of Alzheimer's disease adjusted for the number of seniors in Alaska with Alzheimer's disease. So there's a lot of factors involved in Alzheimer's disease. Um, genetic trait, you know, genetic factors and, and family are, are definitely important as well as age, but also um, cardiovascular disease, um, hearing loss, depression. Uh, these are all factors that play into Alzheimer's disease. And people with Down syndrome um, are high risk for Alzheimer's disease, and they have a condition uh, that's called trisomy. And in Down syndrome, an individual uh, can be born with three copies of the chromosome 21 instead of two, and it's this extra copy uh, of this chromosome 21 that's responsible for the increased production of beta amyloid fragments um, that appear in Alzheimer's disease. So this graph uh, shows the latest findings we have from the Alaska Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey about subjective cognitive decline in Alaska for people aged 60 years and older. So um, the Burfus survey uh, is a survey that's conducted by the telephone. It's conducted in every state. And there's always a set number of questions that are asked um, uh, to um, 
respondents about their um, um, health-related risk behaviors, their chronic health conditions, as well as their use of preventative services. So sometimes uh, the, the breakfast surveys include special modules um, that uh, are able to collect different types of information. So in 2016, uh, the Division of Public Health, uh, at the request of the Alaska Commission on Aging and the Alaska Mental Health Trust Authority, added this module about subjective cognitive decline. And subjective cognitive decline is defined as, uh, and it's self-reported, as a person having increasing memory problems and confusion over the past year. So uh, according to the 2016 um, survey, we found that 14% of Alaskans aged 60 years of age and older self-reported uh, this, this cognitive decline. And it was a higher percentage than what we found in the US, among US seniors, which was 11%. Um, and 41% of the people who reported this um, subjective cognitive decline also noted that they had limitations related specifically to doing their household work, performing on the job, or engaging in social functions because of their cognitive decline. So I just wanted to give you a quick snapshot about Alzheimer's disease in Alaska. Uh, Alaska ranks fifth among all states for a projected increase in the number of seniors age 65 and older with Alzheimer's disease, comparing 2020 to 2025 based on our population growth. So if you're wondering who sits in number one uh, position, it's Nevada, followed by Arizona, Vermont, and then Wyoming. And um, nationally, uh, by 2025, it's estimated that we're going to have 7.1 million people with Alzheimer's. So that's a 27% increase uh, from today. So as you can imagine, um, the Alzheimer's poses a significant health burden on our healthcare system, as well as on family caregivers, and people who care for their loved ones. So here in Alaska in 2019, Medicaid uh, paid $76 million to cover the cost of long-term care for Alaskans with Alzheimer's disease. And that uh, um, amount uh, is projected to increase almost 45% over the next five years. So, so Alaska's projected increase is the highest of all states um, in uh, paying uh, for the cost of long-term care using Medicaid for its um, older population uh, with Alzheimer's. And Medicaid, um, not Medicare, is the, is the payer for long-term care. So this is long-term, long, long, long-term care in nursing homes beyond 30 days, as well as many home and community-based services. Medicare in Alaska paid $24,801 per capita for people with dementia. And Medicare covers the cost of doctor services, hospital care, um, home, um, as well as uh, home health care services, too. And according to the 2016 BRFA survey uh, of those seniors who self-reported cognitive decline, 53% said they had not talked to their health provider about their condition. And sadly enough, a lot of doctors aren't talking to their patients about this condition. So... <clears throat> More has to be done, more education is needed uh, to, um, with doctors, with healthcare providers about Alzheimer's disease and how to uh, broach this sensitive topic with their patients. And then finally, um, Alaska's care, caregiver ratio um, is another, another indicator that we track uh, with regards to the provision of long-term care uh, for seniors. And right now, our caregiver ratio, which is the number of potential caregivers between the ages of 45 to 64 for every senior over the age of 80. Um, we're seeing a decline in the number of caregivers uh, to meet our growing uh, population. So right now we have about 16 caregivers to one elder. And by 2030, that ratio is projected to decline to seven to one uh, in our state because of changing age demographics. So caregiving, caregivers help with a variety of tasks, as many of you may know, um, 
including feeding, dressing, uh, bathing, toileting, helping with incontinence, and many other tasks. And more supports needed for our family caregivers. That's the reason why we're celebrating uh, November as Family Caregivers Month to raise awareness about the value of, of, fair, of family caregivers in our state. So annually, um, the estimated um, value of that care by family caregivers is $495 million for Alaska. So family caregivers are our are, are bedrock uh, for family, um, for long-term care. And so what can we learn uh, from uh, you know, this research about mammalian hibernators that may be applied to better understand Alzheimer's disease uh, in the human brain? Well, one thing, as Kelly had mentioned, we see um, you know, major structural and metabolic changes that happen uh, during uh, hibernation <coughs> to the brains of hibernating uh, mammals. And it's interesting that some of these changes that include this excess uh, production of tau protein and the reduced uh, oxygen supply in the brain tissue, we see this happening both in the, in the brains of, of these small hibernating mammals as well as Alzheimer's patients. But the one thing that, that we're seeing in the, in the brains of the small mammals is that with the excess tau production, we're not seeing the same char characteristic tangles that we see in the Alzheimer's patients. So the amazing thing, to, uh, when these hibernator, hibernators arouse in the spring, all of this, uh, this whole process is reversed. All of this excess tau disappears, the oxygen is flowed to the brain, it flows to the brain, and what we're seeing is that some of these um, uh, processes that are occurring may actually be stimulating stem cells uh, in the brain that's giving rise to a new generation of neurons in the brains of, of hibernating mammals. So we need to learn a lot more about what's going on and uh, then to apply uh, what we've learned to um, hopefully develop some therapeutic treatments to treat um, brain health. And Kelly's gonna to talk to you more about what's happening in that area. I apologize if there's a lot of background. Uh, I don't know, I, there's nothing I can do about it, but hopefully you can hear me. Uh, as you know, I'm gonna to try to go through this pretty quickly, but basically what we know from ground squirrels is that they're very resistant to what we call ischemia reperfusion injury in the brain. So what you see with stroke, what you see with cardiac arrest, when the animals uh, suffer uh, or experience limited blood flow and then it re comes back, they don't have the same injury as other animals or humans. Uh, next slide. So what we're going to do here is to try to understand how to translate that. And there's a number of um, points to make. So next slide. So one of them has to do with uh, understanding frailty. So that's really this that we've, we've emphasized that hibernation involves a regenerative process. Frailty is one of those conditions that are um, uh, is a risk factor for uh, um, developing um, degenerative diseases, neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative diseases. And so by understanding how these animals uh, uh, maintain muscle mass and other organ function, uh, we think we'll have a, have a benefit. And next slide. And this explains one of the approaches to develop new therapies. And this is a project that we have, um, that we have in review, and it is in um, uh, collaboration with a, a small uh, company called uh, Neuronasic Incorporated, uh, located in California. And so by partnering with this company, we're using the ground squirrels as a discovery platform. So what's interesting about uh, ground squirrel brain, either in the whole animal, or if you isolate neurons from the um, hippocampus of the ground squirrel, and you um, challenge it with uh, low oxygen, it actually stimulates growth of what we call neural progenitor cells. So rather than, they, they do show some neuronal depth, just like uh, a rat or a human would do, um, but they also stimulate production and survival of new neurons. And so that is a response that if we can, and, and so using that as a drug discovery platform, what happens is you, um, you look to see what uh, signaling processes um, 
this low oxygen initiates in the ground squirrel neuroprogenitor cells, and then you identify those as targets. And so then you look at all a, a library, it's called a small molecule um, library of drugs expected to affect those targets. And then you screen maybe hundreds of those uh, molecules in a fairly high throughput approach using human neuroprogenitor cells. So uh, neurons, baby neurons from the human brain, now you put into a dish and you give these drugs and you look to see which of those drugs promote new neurons to be grown and produced and survive when the cells are challenged with low oxygen. And so when you find a few of those, those now can become uh, potential therapeutics that will go on to the drug discovery and development pipeline. And so that's how we use the, the, what we call the phenotype of hibernation in a drug discovery platform. And so again, that is with Neuronasic Incorporated, but once those um, small molecules are identified, maybe five of those will be identified, they're in a position now to develop those into new therapies. Um, so next slide. You know, as an example, um, we have done a, a similar drug discovery using um, the ground squirrel, and this is what is the foundation for Be Cool Pharmaceutics that I, I founded. Uh, that really is, um, I, I founded that to be able to enhance the opportunity to develop this therapeutic. And we have what is called the first-in-class thermolytic um, to improve recovery from cardiac arrest. So next slide. So cooling is standard of care for cardiac arrest. It, prote it protects the brain, which usually is what uh, is the cause of death. So although um, many people are resuscitated, only 10% will actually survive uh, to go home from the hospital, largely due to brain injury. So next slide. And so what our discovery that um, of the mechanism the ground schools use to go into hibernation is it, what it does is it turns down the thermostat and it stops um, the body from generating heat. So it makes it much easier to cool the body uh, and we avoid use of these drugs called paralytics that have uh, side effects. Uh, next slide. Uh, and so cooling the brain, not only will, we know it protects from cardiac arrest, it has potential to protect from other forms of progressive uh, degeneration uh, that leads to dementia. Um, so for one, just by protecting the brain uh, due to stroke, uh, it will minimize risk for dementia. Cooling also produces a uh, molecule called RBM3. It's an RNA binding protein that specifically protects against neurodegeneration. And cooling may enhance what's called lymphatic flow, which helps to clear the toxins um, and is a uh, thought to contribute uh, to decreasing risk for Alzheimer's disease. Next slide. So how are we moving forward? Uh, well, we have, um, first we're gonna nurture our investigators uh, by supporting them through core resources, uh, as we talked about the hammer and the AIMS core. Uh, particularly with Hammer, increasing the capacity for clinical research. Our revenue is based first on this uh, COBRI award from the NIH. Uh, we hope to be able to renew that um, in 2024 for up to a total of 15 years. We hope that the support through our core services will increase success with other funding through the NIH uh, called our series and equivalent funding. Uh, we hope to sustain the center by running our course as recharge centers. So when people do have resources, they can pay for those uh, services. Uh, and again, with these discovery, drug discovery platforms, we hope to be able to uh, partner with uh, corporate, um, uh, corporate partners. Next slide. We have a excellent external advisory committee that can um, both uh, advise on our progress as well as our strategy for sustainability. Next slide. And we have a call for proposals for pilot projects uh, and hope to be able to grow the research um, efforts uh, through this pilot project program and develop more investigators. Next slide. So yeah, I, I roughly 
Yeah, we wanted to leave time, a little bit of time. We've got maybe 10 minutes if uh, there are questions. I just want to say thank you again uh, for, for your attention and for your interest. Um, we have time for a few questions, and also there's our contact. Actually, my email is kdrew at Alaska, no L in there. kdrew at alaska.edu. Oh. But Denise has an L in her. She's DL Daniello <laughs> at alaska.edu. And we have a website termalaska.com that has a lot of information. We really look for uh, feedback from stakeholders to see what we can do to better um, fit what we need for the state uh, and hope to be uh, a good partner. So with that, we have time for questions and thank you, thank you everybody. Yes, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Kelly and Denise. Um, I think most participants must have been saving their questions for this live Q&A. But we do have one question about um, this being recorded and if it will be available to people who had to leave early or who were unable to attend and how they would find that. Yes. yes. We, go ahead. I was just going to say that um, Alzheimer's Resource uh, of Alaska is recording um, this presentation. So they'll, sh they'll share um, the link to that recording with us. So if you're interested, if you would like a copy, uh, a recording of this presentation, uh, send either me or Kelly um, an email and let us know. A, a, a couple of folks have already told us that they wanted a copy of the recording, so we're, we know about them. But if, if you haven't previously contacted us, let us know. And we may also be able to post it on our website. Oh. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, now we'll open the floor. Um, if you have a question, please go ahead and you are able to unmute yourself. Um, and participants, you have the floor for questions. Hi, this is a uh, definitely a question for either Denise or uh, Kelly, uh, especially regarding the cool temperatures in Alaska. Why is Alzheimer's uh, disease uh, mortality rate the lowest in Alaska of all, the, of all the U.S. states? Well, I guess I could answer that. Um, so we uh, believe uh, that, you know, a, a big reason is because of Alaska's relatively smaller uh, senior population in comparison to other states. But as our population's um, you know, senior population increases, we're going to see an increasing rise of Alzheimer's uh, disease in Alaska. So, you know, um, other states have much larger populations of people aged 65 years and older, and our population is smaller in comparison to those states. So, so the smaller population puts uh, less stress on the healthcare providers, so, so along those uh, particular lines, ties in with the uh, prediction of a lower rate of health care providers in the future. I don't understand why the why that would be occurring as part of a university that trains healthcare providers. Well, interestingly, um, we need a lot more healthcare providers. You know, we need a big push on healthcare provider workforce. We only have six geriatricians uh, in the state. And I haven't met one yet, but, uh, and these are doctors uh, and other healthcare professionals that specialize in um, geriatric medicine. Yeah. So yeah, we, we definitely need a lot more and we need to start building our workforce now. Yes. We shouldn't be waiting. Thank you. Uh, across, across the whole continuum of care too. I could answer this question about uh, it's uh, interesting that the ground squirrel cells don't rupture when they go below freezing. Um, and is there research on this? Most of that research has gone away from the ground squirrels and into uh, insects that have this remarkable cold tolerance. But what we do know about the ground squirrel is that they seem to lack a nucleating factor, and that's why they don't make ice and why their cells don't burst. Uh, and what how they uh, remove nucleating factors um, is unknown, 
the ultimate application of that would more likely be for organ transplantation uh, rather than for the human, because humans are never going to, at least in, in my lifetime, humans are not going to get that old. Um, but it's a really interesting question and another example of what they have to offer for uh, new discovery. So I've got a question, Kelly. I'm gonna ask you. So tell us, why do some mammals hibernate but others don't? Do we know? So, uh, no, actually the um, expression of hibernation is quite diverse across the phylogenetic tree. Uh, and it's um, really thought that it's an opportunistic adaptation um, and so there's no reason to believe that uh, humans cannot hibernate. And that's one of the reasons why we think our, um, you know, developing the means to cool and to replicate that metabolic suppression in humans uh, should be feasible and possible. But, uh, but certainly it's also a very coordinated suite of adaptations um, that we just have a lot more to learn about. But yeah, there's no good, uh, there, there's, um, there's no genetic, really genetic component to allow animals to hibernate. There's no novel genes that they hold to uh, allow that behavior. Interesting. So people could use hibernation for space travel. That's right. That's wow. Right. And so yep. does, does the center have any projects looking into brown fat activation in humans? That's a good question. We're not actually looking at it in humans, certainly uh, yet anyway. Um, it's uh, uh, more, um, maybe more promising is not just activation, but the browning of white fat. And so the ground squirrels are very adept at uh, turning white fat into brown fat uh, as the, for the winter season. Um, and uh, we certainly know that the brain regulates brown fat activation. So that's what they turn down in order to cool, to go into hibernation. And so understanding that mechanism might give us clues on how to stimulate uh, brown fat metabolism uh, to treat uh, metabolic syndrome. Okay, well, I think you did such a thorough job um, with your presentation. There weren't too many follow-up questions, but we are at the end of our, of our hour and a half time. So I just wanted to take a moment to, again, thanks, Denise. Thank you, Denise and Dr. Drew, for this informative and exciting presentation. A big thank you to all of our attendees. Uh, please remember to reach out to Denise or and Dr. Drew if you would like a copy of the presentation. Uh, their emails are in the group chat. And of course, if you have any questions about Alzheimer's Resource of Alaska and how we might be able to help you and your family or your organization, please let me know. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you.